for me, like I wouldn't even matter if there was no tournament for another 10 years. Yeah. My process would be the same. I mean, I would do it every day. I would do it three times a day. Like last weekend we skied four rounds and then Corey was there and he's like, you don't take a day off. I'm like, <laughs> no, I should. Yeah. That, that would be, that would definitely be the smart thing to do. Yeah. Not ski, but then I skied three times. Yeah. But it was just for me, it was like the atmosphere. I'm in Chico. I got a driver, I got a boat. Yeah. These are great skiers and drivers and, and other people skiing. So I just, I, I just enjoy that process. Yeah. So to me, I get more out of that than, than a rest day. Fuck, I could sleep in hard in these, dude. I had these nice ones and they broke. Dang. Oh, you might have to... Uh... Is that me? I don't know. Could be you. Probably you. Are you telling the wifey what you skied today? Yes. What did she? Was she like? She wants to know who. She doesn't give a shit about me. She wants to know who made the cut. Really? She just bypass. Oh, you're in, honey. Okay. Well, who made the cut? Mm-hmm. That's funny shit. How come I'm only one year? I mean, one fucking one year. I get one ear, you get one ear. I see. So, dude. Fucking one ear. What happened today? Because I thought you were done. You probably told the wife, you're like, ah, uh, yeah. Four. I'm out. Yeah, 439, up, first round. 439. Yeah. I quit. I mean, did you think that. Back to the drawing board. <laughs> okay, well, here's my takeaway, though. We talked about this. I think in training, you, you kill it. I've never seen you tail tail turn one three which is your offside at 39 hardly ever and the first round this morning tail turn one tail turn three what what happens in tournaments you know what's the difference between training where you you never miss 39 and tournaments where sometimes it it doesn't you, you can't quite stay on your ski yeah it's, uh, it's easier in practice because you don't care if you fall hmm. it's just you just go with that yeah it's probably a better way to ski all the time uh but there's a little bit of guardedness, I think, for me. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's much easier. And, the, like, second round was easier. It's like, okay, there's no guardedness. Like, ah, it's not perfect. Just go. Yeah, I mean, did you think there was even a chance to make it second round? No, I wasn't even. And what no. happens? You go you go run friggin' 39 and the ridiculous 30, 40 mile an hour cross win. Yeah, it's just easier when it's do or die and there's nothing to lose. And yeah, you just, you know, you got to go and. Yeah, just uh, that. That, and I also think um, sometimes, like, can't. I, so I ski with Canapa forever and watch him ski, and it's like, oh, that guy, he's getting better and better. And I watch him ski in tournaments, but uh, I know I have a. I, I it's kind of a reference point, like versus like, oh, it's Will Asher versus uh, or like uh, you know, Nate Smith, T-Gas or Nate, all these guys, and they're yeah. big, tall guys, and. Yeah, they can all run 41. So Canapa goes out, runs one at 41 in they the second one. round. It's like, oh, I can do that. Yeah. It's like, yeah. So I think that helps. Versus the first round, is was like, uh, first guy missed 38. Yeah. Like, oh, what's what's going on? Why is it hard? You start thinking. You're like, yeah. what's going on with the boat, the wind, the lake, this yeah. year, the ropes, whatever it is. I think I think it's it's more nerve wracking when people are running 39 and 41, but it's also it lets you know, like, yeah, that's okay. Well. That's what you got to do. Yeah. Speaking of Canada, I was talking to somebody earlier today or before you skied. Um, after Canada ran 1 of 41, I was thinking like Ryan grew up in a time when running 39 was like kind of normal for pros. Whereas like we grew up in a time where running 39 was like, that's that's legit. You know what I mean? Yeah, so like that, for- mentally for him, it's like I feel like it's almost like easier. Not I don't want to say it's easier, but I feel like it's easier for him to like be OK running 39 and it's not such a mental hurdle. Like, whereas for you and I, it's still like, fuck, it's 39. Yeah, it's a little bit of the four-minute mile. Like, yeah, yeah, he just didn't do it. Yep. And it was like, uh, no, r- running 241 was was uh, reserved for Mapple and Coxie. Yeah. And it was, nah, like, I that's not, that's, that's not the shit me. I see on TV. Yeah. For, like, nah, I could do it in practice, but the driving's easier or whatever. But. So how much of that is, like, the four at 39 that you did this morning? I, you know, 
I mean, it's a it's a huge mental game. I think. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, you know the better you are, the taller you are, the the more uh, there's there's more leeway for the better you are. Yeah. And so if you're a tournament, it's a little bit tight, a little nervous, whatever, a little bumpy. You make a mistake. I watched like Freddie Winter. Terrible three ball. Yeah. They're like, oh, I still run it because he, he knows he's gonna run it. Yeah. And he's he's bigger, he's stronger, he's a better skier. Yep. So you just run it because you that's fucking all you got. You that's just, what you're gonna do. That's what you're gonna do. Like, yep. there's no doubt. Well, I think with me, there's a little doubt. There's a little bit of. It doesn't always happen. You know, it's good when it does. When you everything's dialed, it's great. But it's not always there. I I totally agree with what you're saying, but I will disagree in that in practice you still make a sh- like. You'll run 39s that are ugly, and you're yeah. making mistakes. But in practice, you're like, I'm fucking running this pass. Yeah, yeah. There's, t- yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I it's, not that there's not there's not less room for error, which there isn't. There is less room for error, but in practice, you still like you'll figure it out. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. There's more of a determination and not a there's not a worry about losing. Yeah. You just you just get up and try again or whatever. And there's less critical gates because like ah, a little tailwind headway miss the gates by a foot it's like yeah. big deal but tournament's like okay got to get the gate right are you making them in practice uh, sometimes what once in a while <laughs> <laughs> what do you what would you tell people because like i we used to miss them all the time in practice and then you miss them once or twice in a tournament and then it's like uh-oh okay yeah i don't i don't uh i mean missing I, the gates doesn't seem like a big deal, but then if you miss, like, Blaze Grubbs misses Gates twice now in, in some events, and now he's like, oh, wow, okay, maybe I should start making them. Yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't worry about it too much. I, I for the most part, I go through them in the tournaments. Uh, <laughs> and my Gates, not even, it's not even a critical gate. Like, sometimes I'm two-handed. Like, today, the, the yeah. second round, I was two-handed on the first pass. Yeah. So it's like, I'll go, I'll go through it. Um so yeah, it, it's not a big deal for me. It's the I, I think it's more critical for lefties and uh, what, it's, what is a big deal then? Like for you, what's a big key that gets you primed either mentally or physically to go try to run three or four or run forty one? For me, it's mostly about being relaxed and like yeah. having that uh, relaxed confidence. Uh, I mean, definitely when I see my best, I'm most relaxed yeah. and. Uh, not skiing too hard and so i i i find a, a hard balance between like being aggressive enough but also being relaxed and i i can be nervous and go hard but that doesn't work so i have yeah. to be relaxed to begin with but also be aggressive when i need to be so it's finding that balance between the two for me it's that's a hard thing to try to figure out too yeah and it's different it's not like you know Moving it's target. different every round. It's yeah, it's all yep. different from event to event. So, and I, I mean, like I, I feel like even just uh, you know, last pro tournament I skied was a year ago, yeah. and it was terrible. And the one before that was a year before that. So, there's not a lot of like uh, continuity. You don't have a lot of repetitions. Yeah, in it's pro it's events. not like I mean, the more I ski, the more calm I am and relaxed I am. And I mean, even just record tournaments, I don't ski that many. Yeah. So it's hard to get in that groove. Uh, but, like, even from the first round to the second round and then, like, just watching some guys and, like, the second round was way calmer, way – it's like, yeah, big deal, you know. Conditions were worse, but you were more calm and you yeah. were able to perform. Yeah. What What about – um, what about – you were talking about, like, this pro event compared to record tournaments. Like, compare that to, like, when we first started skiing pro events – so here, this is one of our better pro events, Cali Pro Am, private man-made lake. How does that compare to High Point, North Carolina, in 1996? You know, Carl Robert jumping two two fifteen. You know, Andy crushing it on public water. Yeah, I, there's a lot more atmosphere with that. A lot more like, uh, like um, I don't know, like getting signed up and like making sure you had the right registration and like making sure you had the right signatures so that you were allowed to ski that day. And now it's kind of like, yeah, whatever, show up and sign your little thing. And yeah, you're good. You know, we know who you are. And you're fine. But there was, there was a lot of atmosphere. There was a lot of people. There was a lot of music. There was t- uh, other stuff going on. So it just seemed like more, especially for a teenager, it seemed like a way bigger event, which, you know, 
we've done it for a while now, but there there was there was a lot more going on, and uh, now it's it, it's just as important or more important to me now. Uh, but it has a little more of that hometown, yeah, down low feel, grassroots. Yeah, you're walking down the shoreline. People you grew up skiing with yeah. the tournaments and new people that just came from wherever are like, hey, you're were you the guy that just skied? Yeah, that's kind of cool. Especially here, I mean, yeah, it's uh, I mean, lot. Last weekend we had a small tournament. Uh, local people, local guys, it's great, you know. And, and really, when I ski in the tournament, I get the same driver and the same judge, yeah, same boat. So that that part is great. Uh, but it would certainly be nice to be skiing in front of thousands of people. Yeah, but that's not why you do it, I guess, is my point. Like, why no. Why do you ski? I mean, why do you still do it? I asked Freddie Winter that. I, I'm asking Steven that. Like, why do you ski? I just enjoy the process. I enjoy the process of, like, getting a new ski, like, f- working on the boots, trying to figure out the boots that best suit me. I, I like to go to the lake. I just enjoy the whole the whole deal. And it, it would be, for me, like, I wouldn't even matter if there was no tournament for another 10 years. Yeah. My process would be the same. I mean, I would do it every day. I would do it three times a day. Like last weekend, we skied four rounds, and then Corey was there, and he's like, "You don't take a day off." I'm like, "No, I should." Yeah, that, that would be that would definitely be the smart thing to do. Yeah, not ski, but then I skied three times. Yeah, but it was just for me. It was like the atmosphere. I'm in Chico. I got a driver. I got a boat. Yeah. These are great skiers and drivers, and and other people skiing. So I just. Take I, I just enjoy that process. Yeah. So to me, I get more out of that than, than a rest day. Yeah. Well, I think that's, there's, val- there's validity to that because obviously you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, because you love it and because the process is fun, cr- honing your craft and all the little tweaks you can make along the way, whether it's physical, technical, mental equipment. It's all of it. Yeah. It, it's all of it. It's, uh, and, and I don't know, I don't know what else I would do. It's like, I mean, there's I get there's other things I enjoy, but nothing that I enjoy as much as the water skiing. Yeah. yeah. What do you see? What's the one of the biggest, um, I don't know, deficiencies in amateur skiers, tournament skiers that that you coach? One thing that a uh, common mistake that that people make. Uh, there's two things. Uh, well, I don't know. I'll say hips to the handle basically having a strong uh, tug of war position so you got to have some leverage and balancing on the ski so are you standing somewhere near the middle of the ski to where that ski is going to respond and do what you want it to do and and i would say thirdly like uh people looking for some way around that Hmm. looking for some way around that whether it's the setting the driver the the fin settings the the binding the ski the gear whatever it is like there's just no fucking way around that. Like, <laughs> you can't. When it comes down to it, you got to figure those two things out. You got to be able to pull against the boat, and you got to be balanced on the ski. Yeah. It regardless of the ski or the equipment or whatever. You know. Yeah. You can't hack physics. You not. There's no. There's no biohack for, <laughs> for the carbon. No. What What do you want to do in the next, uh, in the next year? What do you want to have accomplished? Uh, What's I'd, a goal? I'd, I'd like to run 41 in a tournament, and it, I don't. That it doesn't need to be a pro tournament. I would just like to do it. Uh, yeah. Just I would. I would like to do it in a legitimate, or what I feel is a legitimate record, record. tournament where it counts, uh, and not for any any list or anything, but yeah. just for me, like because I feel that would be a big step for me. Like yeah. that would that would be super hard, and and that that would just make I don't know. That would just make. I know that when I would do it, I would just be like, "Oh, well, now I can do that," and I would just try to do the next thing. But yeah. for me, that would that would be a big check milestone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've been doing it in practice off and on for the last three or four years, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you do it. You can do it here and there in practice, whatever. Um, but we all know that it doesn't mean shit. I mean, basically, yep. it, and and I know that you can do it in tournament, and it doesn't mean shit as well. I mean, I would say like, oh yeah, that guy ran forty one. Yeah, who was driving? You know, what was yeah. the, you know how long was the rope? Whatever. Um, for me, it would be like, so a site that I know, a boat that I know, yeah. a driver that I know. Like, yeah, that's the real deal. Yeah. And, and yeah, you know, I don't, I don't care if I count. I don't even care if, 
if it goes down anywhere, I just would like to do it for me. So I, I feel like this, you're kind of circling around this, this idea I've had, which is, and this got, when I watched this movie called 180 degrees South, the guy that started Patagonia, the company, his name is Yvonne Chouinard. He was talking about people climbing Everest. And he said, basically something to the effect of there's people that hire Sherpas for $70,000 or whatever to basically carry their stuff up Everest. And they're basically not really, they're climbing it, but they're on oxygen. They're not really pulling their own weight. And he's like, if you do it that way, you're an asshole when you start and you're an asshole when you finish. And I feel like, I feel like you're driven by the process more so than the outcome. And I just feel like we need more of that. Like people ski, like I, I skied because I wanted to score so that people would be like, oh, that's the guy that did X, Y, Z. But at the end of the day, if it was questionable or if it was at a questionable site, it, it compromises my, my feeling of accomplishment. So it doesn't really fulfill me. And it's more about doing something I know I feel good about, you know? And I, I feel like that's what skiing offers people is like, you know, when you go out and everything's clicking and you're in the zone and you run a PB in a tournament, there's a, that's a high that you can't really recreate. That's a high you can't recreate. And that's, it's something you, yeah, it's like it, you, you can't explain it or uh, it doesn't really matter what anyone else says or does. It just, uh, you, that feeling you get for yourself. Yeah. I mean, and the reality is, like, no one gives a shit how you ski. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of true. They I mean, they really don't. They, yeah. yeah, you got buddies, whatever. Hey, good yeah. job, dude. Good yeah. job, buddy. Yeah. Give me some knucks. <laughs> but the reality is, we all do it for ourselves, and it's like, yeah, you, you get your own satisfaction from it. Like, that's it. Yeah. That should be enough. Uh, uh, it'd be great to have money and be able – for me, it's like – I want to be able to ski so that I can ski so that yeah. I want to be a good enough skier so that I can coach I want to be a good enough coach so that I make enough money to coaching that I can then ski and, and you, spend my time skiing ski tournaments so that I can then perform. So back to my question about 1996 pro t- pro tour stop versus 2019. Mm. Is there, is there value enough in what you do as a pro skier that you should be able that not not just you but other people should be able to be compensated enough to be able to do it for a living and not scrape by like you see other sports i'm I'm, let's let's put this in the context of football basketball baseball hockey golf anything else out there where people are killing it is there value enough at least approaching that not not we don't need to be making millions but to where you can like buy a house where you want to buy a house and support your your girl through college and things like that or are we in a different category where skiing's not valuable enough? Uh, I think skiing is every bit as as valuable as any other sport. Um, when it comes down to that, you're talking about people. Are there enough people out there to consume it and to put their their time and their money into it? Um, but it's, there's no value in there's no inherent value in golf over skiing. There's just more people that watch it. Yeah, and there's no. And it's like uh, I've heard a lot of diff- I've heard a lot of different arguments, but when I, when it comes down to um, to every story that I can think of, it comes it comes down to the story of the person. There's a reason to watch. There's a lot of people that golf. There's a lot of people that ride bicycles. There's a lot of people that drive cars, but not many people drive NASCAR, which is a huge yeah. sport. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people that play football in junior high and high school almost no one plays it past that yeah relative to the population but they'll still watch it, it they cut they're, they're gonna watch it there's there's a lot of people that ride bikes but there's not there's no one that climbs the pyrenees like yeah. lance armstrong yeah and when lance is not racing they don't watch yeah comes down to the story comes down to is there a compelling enough story to watch the athlete or the person or the team you know if you take a football team and put them in black and white you, you know, if you take uh, the, the the Bears and the, um, you know. Packers. The Packers, and you put them in black and white, yeah. no one's going to watch. Yeah. There's no difference. So there's it comes no down to the story. So there's no value. And fuck if, I mean, I could throw a football. Yeah. I get run up with a football. But yeah. the, the value is in the story behind that activity. Yeah. That's where people consume. And We've got a lot of stories in our yeah. sport. Nobody's really telling yeah. them. And though. so if you're not telling the story, no one gives a shit. And you, you got to tell that story. 
And yeah. that that's my whole my whole take on it. You gotta you gotta give that story, let that story be known, and give the interest to the people, and they will watch it. And then there's the value. Then there's the consumer value in commercials and, and sponsors and stuff like that. But that's that's how things work, right? Yep. Well, what's the game plan for tomorrow? Finals, head to head, top eight. Do you know who you're lined up against? I think Nate. All yeah. right. Yeah. Top dog. What are you going to do? Are you going to go out there and just like do your thing? Or are you going to, you know, you're skiing against Nate. Are you going to be thinking about that in the back of your mind? No, it won't matter to me. I, to, to be honest, it's probably less pressure on I me. Mean, it's like, all right. So, so I got to run two at 43. Okay. So I probably don't need to hold back too much. Right. Yeah. So like, yeah. I mean, it'd, be, it'd probably be worse if I was skiing against, like, uh, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but, like, yeah. Dane or, or Brian or, like, guys yeah. that are maybe more similar to my my averages yeah. or whatever. That'd probably be like, oh, fuck, I hope I beat them. But, yeah. We'll see what happens. We'll see, we'll we'll see we'll how see. it goes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a new day tomorrow. Hopefully it's not going to be as windy. So I kind of I was hope, I was hoping for the wind today. I was like, yeah, I know. Let's blow. It did blow, but you still ran 241 in it. So, all right, dude, no T Rex arms tomorrow. Friggin' lay it out there. Mm hmm. Brontosaurus. Uh huh. Thanks for talking, dude. Sweet. Success. Awesome. Success. I was, Great I success. Wa I wanted to keep talking, but I got, we got somebody chirping over here. Chirp, chirp, chirp.